Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You're very, very welcome indeed to this IIEA webinar session. And we're absolutely delighted to be joined um, today by such a distinguished speaker in Ambassador Catherine Tai, the US uh, Trade Representative, and indeed the second member of President Biden's cabinet to speak at the IIEA in recent weeks. Uh, we had, uh, we were honored to have Janet Yellen with us in November. But my name is Michael Collins, and I am the Director General of the Institute, the IIEA, and we are Ireland's leading international and European affairs think tank. And we've been in existence now for more than 30 years, bringing expert insight through our speaker programs and dedicated research to Irish, to European, and indeed to a more recently at least a, a global audience. Uh, by bringing distinguished speakers such as Ambassador Tai to address our members, we are able to fulfill our mission of sharing ideas and shaping policy. Before we begin this afternoon, this afternoon's in conversation session with the ambassador, let me briefly uh, run through our running order and the format of the event. Ambassador Tai is going to deliver brief opening remarks of about five minutes or so, and then I will begin with a few uh, questions and we will then turn to you, our audience, uh, for your questions and please feel free to submit these questions using Zoom's Q&A function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. We ask that if you are submitting a question, and please, if you are doing so, please keep the question succinct, brief. You include your name and your affiliation or organization if applicable. We will finish this webinar sharply at 3.45 p.m. Irish time. So I would encourage you to get your questions in early if you have questions to ask. I know that a number of journalists are joining us this afternoon. So a reminder that the full session the initial conversation portion and the Q&A will take place on the record, and you can join the discussion also on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So now let me just formally introduce Ambassador Catherine Tai, who was sworn in as the 19th US Trade Representative on the 18th of March, just after St. Patrick's Day 2021. As a member of the President's Cabinet, Ambassador Tai is the Principal Trade Advisor negotiator and spokesperson on US trade policy, and indeed is right at the epicenter of international trade issues. Prior to her unanimous confirmation uh, by Congress, uh, Ambassador Tai spent most of her career uh, in public service, focusing on international economic diplomacy, monitoring and enforcement, serving as Chief Trade Council and Trade Subcommittee Staff Director for the House Ways and Means Committee in uh, the United States Congress, which of course is shared by our good friend and chairman of the Friends of Ireland in Congress, uh, Congressman Richie Neal, who spoke to us also last year, last May indeed, on the occasion of our 30th anniversary. Ambassador Tai holds a, a degree in history from Yale University and a Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School. So with that, Ambassador Tai, you're very, very welcome to the IDA. It's a pleasure to welcome you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ambassador Collins, for that kind introduction. And I also want to thank IIEA um, for hosting me today. It's a real honor to be here uh, with you and your audience. Uh, I'm looking forward to engaging in a thoughtful um, uh, discussion uh, with you um, and all of you who are tuning in today on what the future of US transatlantic trade will and should bring in 2022 and beyond. Uh, but I want to begin by highlighting some of our accomplishments over the last year and how we can build on these successes this year. When President Biden took office, he pledged to rebuild our alliances with Europe and our partners around the world. Now one year almost into our administration and 10 months since I was sworn in as United States Trade Representative, I believe we have made significant progress in fulfilling the President's pledge, particularly with our European allies. Last summer, we reached interim agreements with the EU and the UK to resolve the 17 year long Boeing Airbus disputes. By thinking creatively, working cooperatively, we were able to put our longstanding differences aside and reach an agreement that will ensure the long-term viability of the American and European aerospace sectors, protect thousands of jobs on both sides of the Atlantic from duties and the effects of non-market financing. 
In resolving this disagreement, the United States and European Union can now turn our attention to addressing harmful non-market practices in the sector uh, from countries like China that distort the aerospace market and create a truly uneven playing field for the rest of the world. Building off of that momentum, we have intensified talks with the EU on steel and aluminum. And in October, we announced a historic arrangement with the EU that will allow the resumption of duty-free European steel and aluminum into the United States. That has happened as of January 1. The EU suspended its tariffs on American steel and aluminum and its retaliatory tariffs on other American products. This deal is also a significant win on a top priority the United States and the EU share, fighting climate change. As part of the resolution, the US and the EU have committed to negotiate the first ever carbon-based arrangement on steel and aluminum trade and create greater incentives for reducing carbon intensity across modes of production of steel and aluminum that are produced by American and European companies. This is an example of what we have been pursuing, which is uh, using trade um, to leverage a race to the top as opposed to a race to the bottom. In October, we further harnessed this momentum and reached agreements with four European trading partners on digital services taxes that have unfairly targeted US companies. Austria, France, Italy, and Spain have agreed to remove their digital services taxes upon implementation of Pillar 1 of the OECD International Tax Agreement, which will help end the race to the bottom over multinational corporate taxation. Additionally, our administration is delighted to have Ireland's support for this agreement, and we look forward to working with you to implement it in the coming months. By resolving all of these trade disputes in our first year, no less, the Biden-Harris administration is showing what we can accomplish when we work with our allies in a collaborative and creative manner. Taken together, these agreements with our transatlantic trading partners have reopened markets and removed or averted the imposition of over $20 billion in tariffs without requiring us to compromise our principles. However, even as we acknowledge our successes in addressing longstanding challenges in our trade relationship with the EU, we must also look to the future. And that is why we have together established the US-EU Trade and Technology Council. What we are calling the TTC is a forum for us to tackle important trade and technological issues that transcend borders, including the non-market trade distortive practices of certain countries that threaten US and European competitiveness and technological leadership. We held the inaugural meeting last fall in Pittsburgh, and I anticipate the TTC will meet again somewhere in Europe later this year. Going forward, the Biden-Harris administration will use the TTC to further the US-EU cooperation on technology and innovation, to advance our shared democratic values and to protect fundamental labor and worker rights. We have also renewed our trilateral partnership with the EU and Japan to address the global challenges posed by non-market policies and practices. In 2022, I am looking forward to continuing to renew our commitment to these trilateral discussions. In the EU, we have a partner that shares our domestic and our democratic values and our commitment to developing concrete outcomes that benefit all of our citizens. Taken together, this work leaves me more optimistic than ever about the outlook for global trade, and I am excited to see what we accomplish together in this new year. With that, I will turn the program back to you, Ambassador Collins, as we begin uh, the next uh, question and answer session. Thank you so much. Um, th thank you, Ambassador, and thank you for that um, 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 presentation. And just uh, talking about the uh, the trade and uh, the TTC, uh, which met, as you say, in Pittsburgh in, in September. Um, is this, and it's got a very, very full agenda. I was reading down through it overnight. It's got a very full agenda indeed. Uh, is this a substitute or a prelude uh, for a, a wider, or an agreement, for example, between the, U the, 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 the EU and the US, a, a trade agreement? I remember very vividly being in the Congress in, uh, in 2013 when President, uh, 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 President Obama uh, initiated TTIPs or the, the the start of negotiations, which of course didn't 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 materialize at the end of the day as, in terms of outcome. So, what is 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 the TTC a prelude to a wider agreement with the European Union, or 
what is the state of, uh, the, or what are the prospects for a, an agreement, a trade agreement between the European Union and the US? Well, thank you very much for that question. Um, you know, I think that uh, for those of us who have been in this business a long time, um, we've tracked uh, the evolution of trade policy, not just from um, our own uh, perspectives, but also in terms of the, uh, the the global trajectory and the global practice for trade policy. Um, you know, I, I don't think of the TTC as either a substitute or a prelude. I think Really, what's interesting as you ask this question is we've really been focused here at USTR on the TTC um, uh, for for the sake of the TTC itself. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about what I mean. I think that um, uh, you know the the TTIP exercise uh, dates back to um, the 2014-15-16 era. Uh, it's now I can't believe we've turned the corner on on the years again. It's now 2022, and I think that in the interim, um, a lot of very important developments have happened. Um, and uh, uh, I think that um, what I really am encouraged by and am enthusiastic about in the TTC is um, its responsiveness to uh, the challenges and the opportunities that we are really facing today, um, that it's really a, a timely partnership in taking on, um, certainly in the trade lane, um, the, uh, um, the issues that uh, crop up with the um, uh, digitalization, uh, the digital uh, transformation of our uh, economies and our global economy, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the challenges in uh, technology leadership, um, and uh, also um, looking at critical issues related to the resiliency of our supply chain, which is, which is really about the, the health of uh, the global economy and um, our ability to uh, bounce back uh, from, um, if not un if, uh, unforeseen, if not um, uh, unpredicted uh, uh, crises like uh, the COVID pandemic. I think that there is a lot of new inputs that um, uh, governments are taking in, and especially in uh, the international economic policy lane um, to push us to innovate. Um, uh, what trade policy means and what the opportunities are in working with our partners, in particular the ones with whom we are uh, so well aligned uh, historically, uh, culturally, uh, politically, and economically uh, to take advantage of uh, the opportunities we have um, to, uh, to fortify ourselves uh, in, uh, in the competition that we face, whether it's from um, uh, other economies in the world or uh, from changing circumstances, uh, in including climate. So in that sense, then, uh, you know, a formal trade agreement between the European Union and, and the United States is not immediately in prospect then. You know, I, 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 I never say never. I never want to foreclose opportunities. Uh, I am always about uh, generating options uh, to allow for optimization of where we may take things in the future. But um, with respect to the TTC, as you've noted, uh, the agenda is very, very full. Uh, and, um, you know, I... I feel very strongly that uh, as we've designed it together between the US and the EU, uh, that it is actually quite a comprehensive approach to uh, the most pressing um, issues uh, that are facing us together today. Okay. Let me just come to a question that, that's come in already from um, Simon Lester from the World Trade Law, I think it is. Uh, his question is, um, can you give us an update on any recent steps the US uh, TR's office has taken to enforce the US-China phase one trade deal. Well, I know Simon well by reputation, and uh, I have been a consumer of his um, his uh, WorldTradeLaw.net uh, database and um, uh, um, uh, network um, uh, since I was a junior trade lawyer. So, uh, hello to Simon. Um, you know, I really want to respect uh, uh, the forum uh, here today, focusing on um, uh, Ireland and uh, European affairs. Um, but uh, let me take this opportunity um, to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, China through the lens of uh, US-EU cooperation. Um, and I think that in my opening remarks and uh, also uh, in the way that we are approaching the TTC on both sides of the Atlantic, I think we are very much focused on um, the increasing uh, challenges, uh, just, just um, um, the scale of the challenges, but also the increasing complexity of the challenges that we face in um, uh, 
continuing to um, compete with China uh, on uh, the global economic stage. Um, and uh, whether it is through TTC, um, our uh, uh, new posture on large civil aircraft, um, uh, steel and aluminum, um, I think that uh, uh, we have really invested in um, a partnership uh, with the EU um, to um, uh, take on the challenges together and to really amplify um, uh, our shared interests in um, maintaining our competitiveness in an increasingly uh, challenging and complex world. Very good. Um, just on the um, coming back uh, to to more specifically uh, to to um, to Europe, I suppose, and our neighbours, of course, our next door neighbour here, the United Kingdom, of course, has a has an independent channel of um, of, of engagement with the USTR, um, and uh, we've spoken about the prospects for the Euro EU wide. Um, engagement and the actuality of EU-wide engagement with the United States on uh, trade issues. Uh, how do you see the prospects, and, and uh, obviously for the UK it's something of a priority, how do you see the prospects uh, for a US-UK trade agreement and, um, and, and when do you think uh, such an agreement might materialize if there is a prospect of one happening? Ambassador Collins, um, uh, thank you for that uh, uh, balanced question, um, taking it from the EU side and then uh, now from the UK side, uh, I see the logic in how you're approaching uh, these questions and I appreciate it deeply. Um, you know, I think that um, uh, on, on this, uh, uh, we are approaching our conversations with the, with the UK um, consistent with um, the overall approach that we are taking as an administration, which is um, a focus on uh, building back better. Um, and that is very much um, uh, in response to the need that we have uh, globally, economically, um, to, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, to continue to the fight against the pandemic, um, to uh, take the opportunity um, to, uh, in, in crisis, uh, to rebuild uh, and to rebuild uh, along lines that correct for um, um, aspects of our economic systems um, that uh, uh, could use shoring up. And um, uh, you'll see in uh, a lot of the activities of uh, the Biden-Harris administration over the course of 2021, uh, this focus on um, investment, investment in um, infrastructure, for instance, uh, investment in um, the US uh, economic um, uh, structures, um, investment in our relationships. And uh, uh, with respect to um, the US and the UK, we are approaching our trade relationship uh, consistent with the way that we are approaching everyone, which is, um, uh, you know, how can we enhance our um, uh, connectivity uh, and ensure that it is uh, supportive of and reinforcing of building back better, both at home and also building back better um, uh, on, a, um, uh, on an international um, uh, uh, basis. Um, <clears throat> So that's uh, that's my first point, uh, and you know I think that um, uh, we also um, are seeing a lot of the fruits of our efforts uh, in my engagements with uh, Secretary Trevelyan um, and um, uh, Foreign Secretary Truss, who had been uh, my counterpart earlier in the year in 2021. Uh, we've carried a consistent message that um, uh, from our side, uh, the way we talk about it is our approach to trade will be a worker-centered one, uh, and that is to really focus on um, uh, putting the, um, the human um, uh, worker uh, community impacts of trade uh, into the center of our decision making. And uh, I think that whether it is with the UK or with the EU, um, and certainly with other partners as well, um, we are getting a very, very good reception in terms of um, orienting ourselves to um, how we can um, uh, harness the power of trade policies and trade and economic cooperation um, to um, uh, make it a force for good uh, in our economy and in the world economy. Um, so uh, with respect to the US-UK uh, trade agreement, um, you know, uh, again, uh, I think that um, uh, um, our approach um, uh, continues to be focused on building back better and um, um, the way we talk about it, uh, worker centrism and um, uh, responding to uh, the uh, challenges and needs of today, including uh, cooperating on uh, developing uh, tools and strategies uh, to ensure that 
that um, our economies remain competitive. So um, I'd say that uh, you know at the moment um, it's uh, um, uh, it's um, uh, our our work with the UK um, is running in parallel with uh, the work that we are doing uh, with the EU. And again, uh, we will see where all of this goes. I continue every day when I wake up um, and you know read the papers and turn on the news uh, to be amazed by um, the sense of uh, fluidity in the global economy and the degree to which we are all still adapting to um, uh, you know maintaining a momentum in terms of recovery. Uh, and I think that um, you know uh, where we are right now affords us many many opportunities and will continue to do so in uh, innovating the way that we approach each other um, for uh, for optimizing our opportunities. Yeah, just forgive okay. me about. Sorry, go ahead. Um, just for, forgive me just for going a little bit local uh, for a second. Um, there's a huge amount of interest here, obviously, in the linkage, if any, uh, which the United States may see between the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol, which I'm sure you're uh, familiar with, uh, and, uh, and the protection of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, and whether these might be a factor in agreeing a US-UK uh, trade agreement or indeed easing uh, the steel and aluminium tariffs on the UK. And members of Congress have frequently spoken, or occasionally at least spoken on, on a possible linkage there. Would you like to just speak to that for a little bit, whether there is an expectation on the US side that in moving forward on the trade front, that they uh, there would be an expectation that they will fulfill their obligations under the, um, uh, under the Northern Ireland Protocol? Um, I know that uh, this is a, a matter of uh, considerable interest, and I'm glad that you're asking this question. Um, let me say, um, let me begin by reiterating that um, President Biden, um, the U.S. Congress, uh, and I care very deeply about supporting and preserving uh, the Good Friday Agreement uh, that has brought peace to uh, Northern Ireland and uh, the, the island of Ireland. Um, I understand that the UK and the EU um, are continuing in critical discussions over implementation of the Irish Protocol. And uh, we are encouraging uh, here on our side of the Atlantic, uh, both the UK and the EU to find a solution that is durable and that maintains peace uh, in Northern Ireland. I would expect um, that, uh, uh, you know, on our side, given um, uh, the uh, deep levels of interest uh, that are here uh, and um, uh, the sense of investment in um, the legacy of the Good Friday Agreement, um, that uh, what happens uh, in these engagements between um, the UK and the EU uh, will, um, uh, will always be on the radar here and will be part of um, our uh, uh, um, uh, our, our, um, our awareness, um, uh, both the UK and uh, the EU, uh, are very, uh, very uh, important um, strategic and um, um, uh, economic partners uh, of the United States. And um, uh, it will continue to be something, I think, that uh, we, will, um, uh, we will be tracking with interest. Uh, but let me just reinforce um, uh, our position in encouraging both sides um, uh, the UK and the EU um, to uh, to work uh, in good faith uh, and as tireless, tirelessly as uh, I know that um, uh, people have been um, to uh, to find uh, that solution that will be durable and peaceful. Um, on um, uh, the steel and aluminum um, issues, um, you know. Um, uh, let me say on that, uh, we um, we continue to be grounded uh, in those efforts on um, the big picture, uh, which is where the uh, global um, uh, international uh, economic pressures are coming from. And we will continue to look for um, uh, opportunities uh, to be um, aligning ourselves uh, with our closest partners on this to take on the challenge together uh, rather than alone. Okay, well, I might just jump around a, a little bit here, if I may, uh, Ambassador, questions that have come in. Uh, one here from Michael McCarthy Flynn, who's the Head of Policy and Advocacy for Oxfam Ireland. Uh, he asks, uh, what arguments would Ambassador Tai deploy to try to persuade Ireland and the EU to support the TRIPS waiver, the TRIPS waiver uh, at the WTO? Well, uh, that's an important question and one that we have been um, um, 
uh, focused on for um, uh, much of 2021 uh, and continue to be focused on here. Um, let me say a couple words here. Um, I appreciate the way that uh, the question is framed. Um, I might tweak I might tweak the the framing a little bit in my in my response, which is um, uh, what are we doing here um, to uh, 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 rally uh, and corral support um, around uh, the TRIPS waiver effort uh, at the WTO. Um, I think one of the really interesting aspects of, and it, it is actually really difficult and challenging, uh, about uh, the TRIPS waiver conversation is that, um, you know, there is the TRIPS waiver as it was uh, introduced by um, uh, proponents uh, led by uh, South Africa and India um, now um, uh, over a year ago, um, anticipating uh, that there would be uh, developments um, uh, to address, uh, uh, to create tools for us for responding to the pandemic. Um, I think that, you know, um, one um, uh, aspect that I just want to highlight is um, for, for those who are not um, uh, very familiar with the way the WTO works, um, Part of part of what makes WTO work really hard, uh, but also um, something that makes the WTO really unique um, and is important to uh, the structure of the WTO is uh, the WTO um, uh, operates on a consensus basis, uh, which means that it truly is focused on um, its membership and um, uh, you know, uh, in the positive light, uh, consensus basis means that you can only move forward when you have done the work and, uh, to listen to everyone and to um, get everyone to uh, to move uh, in in a particular direction. Um, on this issue, uh, I think that the most um, the most powerful argument is um, for as long as we are not able to effectively and uh, comprehensively deploy the tools that are being developed to manage and address um, uh, the, um, uh, the COVID epidemiology, um, our global economic situation will continue to be at the end of a leash um, that is controlled by um, uh, the pandemic. And uh, I know how deeply frustrating it is for um, uh, everyone. Uh, I feel it personally, but I think that this is something that everyone in the world feels around this, you know, two steps forward, one step back kind of sense of progress that we are making in terms of taking on the global um, uh, COVID challenge. And it has economic implications. So, you know, for the context of the WTO, uh, there, is a, there is a public health and there is a moral um, uh, aspect to this, which is, uh, let's save lives. But, you know, to translate that into economic terms, I think that until we have um, um, a facilitated uh, really comprehensive access uh, to the um, uh, the tools that uh, we are developing, and you know, again, all credit to the scientists um, who are um, uh, you know making um, uh, miracles happen uh, through their uh, technical work. But un until we really comprehensively are able to provide access to those tools, uh, we're going to continue to be in this herky jerky, you know. Uh, supply chain disrupted uh, situation um, that uh, I know uh, is just deeply challenging to all of us, but uh, will pose a major obstacle to the um, robust recovery that we are all looking for. And uh, Ambassador, as we're on the WTO, I've got a question here from one of our own uh, researchers, Dara Lawler, and also from uh, Dan O'Brien, who's our chief economist on, as a, on the WTO. And uh, I suppose it boils down to a question about how does the US plan to progress the reform agenda at the WTO, particularly with regard uh, to the WTO's appellate body? Ambassador Collins, could you repeat the question? I think uh, I've got all the nouns and I think I might've missed the verb in there. Okay. It just says, how does the US plan to progress the reform agenda uh, at the WTO, particularly with regard to the WTO's appellate body? Got it. Got it. Uh, the the key the key distinction is uh, progress used as a verb. Okay. Uh, no, I appreciate this question. And um, on the WTO questions, in particular, the ones that touch on dispute settlement, um, I've always got to exercise a little bit of discipline because I'm I want to go down rabbit holes because this is uh, this is actually the um, uh, the environment in which I grew up as a as a trade policy professional as as a trade lawyer and a and a litigator litigator on behalf of the United States at the WTO. So I have a lot of thoughts on 
on this. And maybe what I'll just do is by way of saying that I have a lot of um, uh, thoughts, um, translate that into, um, uh, I wanna convey how, how deeply I care about this issue. Um, uh, and um, 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 how many um, uh, ideas uh, and how hopeful I am um, about um, uh, taking on a reform effort at the WTO. First, as a reform effort uh, to continue to push the members of the WTO uh, to motivate us collectively to push the WTO to be more responsive to the state of the global economy as it's evolved, whether with respect to um, how our trading partners have evolved at the WTO. I think since, um, since 1994, um, there are more members now. Um, and over the course of, uh, I guess, the almost 30 years, um, that uh, is 1994, 95, uh, that the WTO started getting up and running, um, uh, you know, the membership has not only increased in number, but also um, the, the development, uh, economic development of some of those members um, have really um, created changes in the global economic landscape. So there is a need for the WTO itself to evolve, um, to uh, respond to our new reality. On dispute settlement, I see that dispute settlement piece being a, um, a part of uh, this larger um, need for reform. And there's a lot of energy. Um, there are a lot of ideas. And you'd be surprised um, at how thoughtful uh, those who do work um, on trade and, and the WTO in particular, um, uh, people are, um, uh, you know, um, representing different countries. So I'm very optimistic here on dispute settlement. Uh, similarly, um, I think that uh, we need to come back to first principles on dispute settlement. I know there's a lot of focus on the appellate body, and I completely understand why it's there on the appellate body and why it's there on us. Uh, but I want to expand the conversation to say that, um, you know, as the WTO um, uh, needs um, to be reformed, to be responsive, uh, so too does its dispute settlement function uh, need to um, evolve as, as part of um, the institution. And I'll just say a couple words here. We are really excited. We have started engaging with our partners. Uh, we're really excited to bring a vision um, and, and to engage our vision uh, with the visions and interests of um, all of the WTO members around, you know, uh, what it is a dispute settlement function um, uh, should provide. We think most fundamentally it, it, should, it should facilitate the settlement of disputes between members. Um, <clears throat> Uh, second, I think that fundamentally as an institutional matter, um, it should uh, reinforce and facilitate the functioning of the other aspects of the WTO, the negotiating function and also uh, the monitoring function at the WTO as opposed to stifling them. And third, when we talk about dispute settlement, let's you know ground it in um, the, the settlement of disputes and separate it out from the litigation aspect, which is only one method of settling disputes. So, um, you know, I've laid out some of this uh, in uh, the speech that I gave in Geneva last October. Um, uh, we will continue to do our work and um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, excited and optimistic about the engagement um, uh, that uh, uh, lies before us uh, and taking on the question of how do we, how do we take this opportunity of reform um, to um, build back the WTO better. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, some of these questions now may go back a little bit on some of the things you've already addressed. If you if you feel you've already addressed them, that's fine. Uh, but a question here from uh, Bill Emmett, who's an IIEA member, and of course, who's a former editor of The Economist uh, magazine. And he says, thank you, Ambassador Tai. He said, two quick questions. One, why? Has the U.S. removed tariffs on steel uh, for the e for the EU, but not for the UK? And the second question is: What prospects do you see for the U.S. joining the CPTPP, uh, which the United States originally shaped? Thank you so much, and I will try to um, uh, be uh, briefer in my responses so that we can get to more questions. Uh, and I appreciate the the uh, clarity of the questions. One, uh, why have we removed tariffs for the EU and not the UK? Um, so, you know, um, I will say uh, the process that we went through in um, uh, negotiations and uh, discussions with the EU took us about six months. Um, we kicked them off um, uh, with a commitment at the US EU uh, summit. 
uh, when President Biden made his first trip um, uh, out of the country and to Brussels last June, uh, that we would take this up with the EU. And um, I think that uh, was Halloween, October 31st, uh, when we announced that um, uh, we had this solution here for uh, moving forward with the EU. Um, <clears throat> You know, I just want to I want to focus on uh, the fact that what we accomplished was not just removing tariffs uh, and, you know, the complexity in the discussions and why it took um, every just about every minute and every day of those six months is um, when I talk about uh, resolving um, the, the tensions between us um, and, you know, optimizing um, opportunities for trade without compromising our principles, uh, it very much is a characterization of the 232 discussions that we had with the EU, which is um, how can we ease up um, the, the trade measures that we've taken between us when um, we have so much in common uh, in terms of our interests to be um, globally uh, competitive and to uh, continue to be able to produce uh, steel and aluminum um, in, uh, in our countries and our economies. Um, and so, you know, what I really want to draw attention to is um, uh, the arrangement that we arrived at it does um, uh, uh, loosen up uh, the trade restrictions uh, between us, between our markets. Uh, but um, most importantly, it is aligning our economies to take on the pressure that is uh, impacting both of us globally, which is the uh, overcapacity in both of these sectors. Um, and so, you know, um, to, to get at the, the question here, um, these conversations, the negotiations are really important, especially on that last part, which is how do we align um, uh, against um, that uh, global overcapacity pressure? And, um, you know, how do we commit to developing um, uh, strategies and new tools together? And that's that's the global arrangement part, the forward-looking piece around um, ensuring that uh, we are trading between us, uh, fair, fairly produced and traded steel and aluminum, uh, and also looking at the carbon intensity and uh, retaining um, this uh, um, uh, mandate that we have to consider the sustainable ability of our trade uh, and our production. Um, so um, uh, why not the UK yet? Um, I think, you know, my response is uh, it's, it's a matter of um, uh, uh, pragmatism. Um, you know, it took us six months to, uh, to conduct these negotiations with the EU. Uh, we have formally started um, our consultations on um, 232 with uh, Japan. Um, as of, uh, I, I don't remember the date, I would say, I would say as of um, second half of December. And, um, uh, you know, uh, we just need to have a, a process that makes sense. Um, but certainly um, uh, the UK is very much on our minds. Um, and um, uh, I am confident um, that we will take this up um, uh, when the time is right. Um, on uh, the CPTPP question, just again, in the interest of brevity, I think I might just uh, copy and paste and then edit a little bit the answer I provided earlier um, to your question, Ambassador Collins, around um, you know the, the TTIP, uh, which is um, right now our focus uh, with the EU is on the TTC, uh, with our partners in um, uh, Asia um, and the Indo-Pacific region, uh, we are bringing um, what the president has uh, described as the uh, an Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework. Uh, and I think that there, there are parallels here in terms of uh, what we are trying to accomplish and the, the partnerships and bridges that we are seeking to build, which is ones that respond to uh, the needs that uh, all of our economic policymakers are facing right now with respect to ensuring that um, our trade engagement is um, focused on and supportive of um, uh, 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 sustainability, uh, resilience, uh, inclusiveness and also competitiveness. So um, um, if it's okay for me to copy and paste and refer back to an earlier answer, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. Um, we're coming towards the end now, we've just got to watch the, the time here a little bit. Um, just uh, maybe if we, uh, just ask you two questions, maybe if they're unrelated, but just uh, within the time available, uh, to whatever extent you can address them. One is from Susanna Choi. Uh, she says, can you speak to next steps and aspirations for the carbon elements of the US EU steel and aluminium trade deal? And will this serve as a blueprint for other commodities going forward? And then just a second question, if I may, just to wrap it up then, 
And we'll wrap it up on this basis then from Doug Palmer from Politico. He says, could you talk about uh, your recent, uh, your goals for the recently resumed trilateral talks with the EU and Japan? You already spoke about this to some extent. Anyway, he says quite a few, quite a bit of work has um, was done during the Trump administration in areas like industrial subsidies and forced technology transfer. Are you planning to build on the work that was done in the Trump administration or do you want to move negotiations in a new direction? And when do you expect to hold the next trilateral meeting with the EU and Japan counterparts? And what do you expect can be accomplished by them? There are a lot of questions there. So in the time available, we have about three minutes. Uh, uh, if you could do your best uh, to cover as much of that as you could. And then we wrap up. Wonderful. Um, well, um, I, I've got uh, I've got questions from real taskmasters, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, we're always uh, uh, wanting to make sure we uh, we stay on task. Um, to uh, Susanna's question uh, about next steps on the global arrangement, uh, we've uh, I think our, our teams have already started meeting, um, and uh, um, uh, you know um, this is critical. Uh, we're under a bit of a clock, um, but uh, you know. Um, I think that um, certainly on our side uh, of the Atlantic, um, and um, um, I will let um, um, Executive Vice President Dombrovskis speak on his side, um, but um, I have no reason to think that um, his views will be different. Um, you know, uh, we, um, we're really committed to uh, this vision uh, that we are, uh, we spent 2021 building, which is uh, of uh, really strong uh, US EU cooperation um, on uh, the, the shared challenges and the pressures that um, uh, our economies, our industries, and workers uh, are facing uh, globally. So, um, where this can take us, Susanna, your question about other commodities, um, it's a really interesting question. I hope that, you know, um, in a couple of years when we look back, we'll realize um, uh, we've accomplished more than just uh, something on steel and aluminum and that this will be uh, useful uh, to a broader conversation. Um, but uh, perhaps we can reconvene, uh, you know, uh, intermittently uh, and see, see where it takes us. Uh, for now, I think we're focused on uh, the task before us. Um, uh, Doug, uh, to your question about the trilateral, um, uh, yes, uh, uh, we're looking to build um, again um, and to adapt the trilateral forum um, to uh, the, the evolution of the challenges that we're facing. I think the challenges we are facing before we are still facing, but there are also new aspects of those challenges, um, developments in those challenges, um, including, I would say, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, I won't go into details just for the sake of time, um, but, uh, you know, uh, always wanting to make sure that uh, the investment of our time effort um, uh, with our partners um, is, uh, is responsive to um, the real problems that we are facing. And on when the next trilateral meeting will take place, um, I'll just confess to you, uh, sometimes I'm the, I'm the worst person to ask about this um, because uh, I usually know when it appears on my calendar uh, and I know I got to start doing my homework. So um, uh, I know someone is working on that, uh, someone's on my team and I'll just have to defer to them. Very good. Listen, you're very generous with your time, uh, Ambassador. Uh, we're coming to the end. Uh, we're at uh, at 3.45 Irish time. So we're going to wrap it up there unless there's any uh, final remarks that you want to make. But uh, just from my, on, on my own behalf, on behalf of the Institute and its membership, just want to say thank you. It's a very special moment for us that, that, that you've chosen uh, to give us this time and to cover as many issues we as we were able to do in the three quarters of an hour that we had. Uh, you've been very generous, we very much appreciate it, and we very much look forward to welcoming you to Dublin physically at some stage in the not too distant future. Um, uh, anytime, I would love. I, I would love to come, and uh, you know, again, um, uh, uh, just uh, circumstances permitting, uh, sooner or later, uh, I will find my way. Uh, thank you for that very generous uh, invitation, and and thank you for uh, hosting me at this forum. Um, it is a real um, uh, privilege for me um, to uh, have the opportunity to engage, and I want to thank you, um, IIEA, and all of your audience uh, for your interest um, in uh, what I have to share. Okay, good luck with all of your work. Thank you very much indeed.